All right, class. So welcome. This is kind of our second day of class. So here we are Monday, uh, January 24th. I just have our schedule pulled up. Um, you know, we met on Wednesday, but half of you didn't have lab yet. So um, just no worries if you have lab today on Mondays. Um, we'll be going over the syllabus in a little more detail. So we'll go over the syllabus in lab if you're in section one. Um, that's hopefully that'll make a little more sense. Thanks for putting your attendance in the chat. So today we are Monday, um, January 24th. I'm just gonna go ahead and highlight this. Um, so if you, so we always meet Monday and Wednesday for class at 7.30. Today we'll be going over chapter two, the chemical basis of life. Excuse me, I just had a tickle in my throat. All right. So. So sorry about that, guys. All right. Um, so here we have the syllabus, just or the schedule just taken from the syllabus. We'll go over chapter two today, the chemical basis of life. So before we get into a lot of the anatomy and physiology, we have to talk a little bit about chemistry. And then if you do have lab on Mondays, we'll be, we'll be going over today in lab what uh, Wednesday's group did last week. So we're going over the syllabus, going over a couple exercises and a couple of activities. Um, in lab will make a lot more sense once we go over it in person. So, um, and then on Wednesday, we'll be covering chapter three, cell structures and their functions. Um, so just keep in mind this schedule that is in the syllabus, I follow pretty much pretty well. And again, um, I think I posted, let me know if I did it, but I believe I posted all the PowerPoints uh, to your Canvas pages under files as well as the link to um, our class YouTube channel where you can watch previous recordings if you want to. All right, any questions I might go ahead and, um, or feel free at the end of class to just stay on after if you have any questions as well. But I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint for chapter two on the chemical basis of life and we'll get started here. So like I said before, um, you know, anatomy and physiology, we're going to be learning a lot about body systems, nervous system, muscle system, etc. But before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about chemistry, which no one likes to do. Um, but we have to have a little bit of background on basic chemistry, just because all of the processes in the body undergo chemistry and chemical reactions to keep up with all of the physiological changes that your bodies are going under. So a little bit about basic terminology with chemistry. Um, matter is anything that occupies space and has mass, like a solid, liquid, or gas. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. And then weight, specifically, is the gravitational force acting on an object. So our weights will be different on Earth versus the moon, because gravity is a little different on the moon. Elements and atoms. So an element is the simplest form of matter. And we have the periodic table of elements, which lists all the elements um, using their atomic symbol. So C stands for carbon, H stands for hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, calcium, potassium is K, sodium is Na, and or is C. So elements are just the simplest form of matter, and elements will come together to form molecules, which will then make up matter. If an atom, itself is the smallest particle of an element. So we have carbon atoms that make up carbon element. Uh, we have oxygen atoms that make up the oxygen element. Um, an atom itself contains protons, electrons, and neutrons in a way that is shown here. So we have the nucleus of the atom made up of protons that always have a positive charge and neutrons, which have no charge. And then surrounding the nucleus is kind of our cloud of electrons, which have a negative charge. And the electrons float around the cloud, kind of, or float around the nucleus, much like a cloud. Um, we talk about kind of a planetary, um, and then um, a planetary model of atomic structure describing how electrons kind of float or orbit around the nucleus, much like planets orbiting around the sun. So this is our planetary model of atomic structure. The hydrogen atom has one proton um, with one electron in the cloud kind of orbiting around that nucleus. 
a carbon atom has six protons and six neutrons, which make up its nucleus with six electrons orbiting around. And you'll see here that the proton has a positive next to it because it has a positive charge. Protons are always positively charged. Neutrons are neutral charged, so we just put a zero next to it. But then we have the little E standing for electrons with the negative sign, um, standing for electrons have a negative charge. And then the oxygen atom is made up of eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus with the eight of negative electrons kind of orbiting around the nucleus, much like, again, the planets orbiting around the sun. But we found out later that these electrons are kind of more like going all over the place, more like a cloud uh, kind of idea around the nucleus itself. So here are the subatomic particles that make up the atom. The proton is the positively charged particle located inside the nucleus. The neutron is a neutral, so it has no charge to it. It's also located inside the nucleus. And then the electron uh, is the negatively charged particle located outside the nucleus. And these electrons are what will interact with the electrons of other atoms. And when the electrons are kind of shared between two atoms, that will form a bond or connect those atoms together. So again, here's the model of the atom with the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and then the electrons surrounding the nucleus. The atomic number and atomic mass, um, again, give us ideas about how these atoms are made up. The atomic number always refers to the number of protons in each atom. And the atomic number and the mass number are always found next to the atomic symbol in the periodic table. And I'll show you what that looks like. But again, if you can remember, atomic number means proton number. And mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons in each atom. So if we know the atomic number and the mass number um, from the periodic table, we'll be able to calculate out the number of neutrons just by simple um, subtraction. And I think I'll show you an example of this. Um, and actually what, what I might do, all right, I'm just gonna give an example. So for carbon, this is C, the atomic number and mass number are usually located either as a subscript or superstrict next to the atomic symbol in the periodic table. So for example, carbon, the atomic number is six. So in carbon then we know we have six protons because the atomic number gives us the number of protons. And the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. So if our mass number is 12, for example, for carbon, we know that there must be six neutrons because six plus six equals 12. And the other key thing to remember is that the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons um, in, an electric, in an electrically neutral atom so that the number of protons will balance out the number of electrons. So that's how we would see kind of in a, um, a period uh, element in the periodic table with a little box around it. The atomic number would be the number of protons. The mass number would be the number of protons and neutrons. So from that, we could, you know, simple subtraction, get our number of neutrons. And then again, the number of protons usually always equals the number of electrons, unless we're talking about an isotope where um, things might change a little bit. A chemical bond then. So we talked about how atoms form elements, but how do we get from the elements that make up our body or this table or my coffee? Um, how do we create matter? And we create matter when we form chemical bonds between atoms. And a chemical bond occurs when the outermost electrons or the electrons furthest away from the nucleus are transferred or shared between atoms. So I might have the electrons from a sodium atom being shared with electrons from a chlorine atom. When the electrons are shared, they'll form a bond. For example, sodium chloride, when those atoms come together, that forms table salt, sodium chloride. And these are the types of chemical bonds we can have. And you should know these different types of chemical bonds for a test question, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. And we'll go over them now. In order to understand ionic bonding, let's talk about what an ion is first. An ion is just a charged atom, either positive or negative, formed because a donation 
or a gain of electrons. So for example, sodium usually has a positive charge to it because it's donated an electron. Remember, an electron is negative. So if an atom gives up one of its negative charges, it will become positive. Um, chlorine is usually a negative ion because it has gained an extra electron. So it has gained an extra negative charge, so it usually carries a negative charge to it. And an ionic bond occurs when there's an attraction between two oppositely charged ions. So this is what gives table salt its unique properties. Sodium and chlorine are oppositely charged ions and they will attract each other. The positive and negatives attract to each other and we get sodium chloride or table salt. Because they're attracted to each other, they can form really pretty crystals. And those are salt crystals. If you look at salt really carefully, Underneath the microscope, you'll see really beautiful crystals that um, the sodium chlorine come together and create when they're attracted to each other in an ionic bond. So that's the first type of bond, ionic bond. And this is a look about how sodium loses an electron, becomes positive, chlorine gains an electron, becomes negative. And then these ions now with opposite charges can attract each other, share electrons, in their outermost shells or their area furthest away from the nucleus and create a new compound or a new molecule called sodium chloride, which is table salt. Covalent bonds occur when atoms share one or more pairs of electrons. So for example, a hydrogen molecule, um, this is a covalent bond where just any atoms just share electrons between them. Um, we can have polar covalent bonds uh, form when there is an unequal sharing of electrons. So let's say we have, for example, in water, we have two hydrogens. So I'm going to just draw a hydrogen and a hydrogen atom over here, and then I'll draw an oxygen up here. And because they're different atoms, they're, they're, une they're unable to share electrons equally. So in re reality, we kind of get water looks like this and oxygen kind of has an extra pull on electrons. So oxygen becomes a little more negative. Um, so because there's more of like a negative charge surrounding the oxygen, it kind of pushes the hydrogens out at an angle. So that water, H2O, um, if we're looking at it at an anatomic level, it looks kind of like a triangle in shape. So this is a polar covalent bond because there's an unequal sharing of electrons because the oxygen kind of holds on or the electrons kind of um, are more kind of held closely to oxygen than the hydrogens. A polar molecule has an asymmetrical electrical charge much like what we're looking at in water here. So because electrons are held more tightly to oxygen, on the hydrogen end of the molecule, they're a little more positive. And nonpolar molecules have a symmetrical electrical charge. So here's a look at covalent bonding. Remember, covalent bonding just means that electrons are shared. So here we have a positively charged nucleus of each hydrogen. They are attracted to the electron of the other. And what, we've, are, what we're forming here is um, two hydrogen bonds bounded to each other. And that line signifies that they're sharing a pair of electrons. So this is um, just a covalent bond because they're sharing electrons between them. Hydrogen bonding um, is when polar molecules like water form bonds with each other. So hydrogen bond, for example, a polar molecule like water and polar means there's an unequal sharing of electrons. So we kind of get like a triangular shape to the molecule. There's a positive and a negative end and the hydrogen bond forms when the positive end of one polar molecule is weakly attracted to the negative end of another polar molecule. And one thing to remember, this might be a test question, is that the hydrogen bond is the weaker um, bond out of all three. It's the weakest bond out of ionic or covalent. Then hydrogen bonds are really important because we'll see hydrogen bonds between our base pairs of DNA so that our DNA can be easily kind of separated and cut back together because they're very weak bonds. So here we have polar covalent bonds um, like water have a positive and negative end to them. So here we have um, the oxygen atom connected to two hydrogens. This is H2O. There will be kind of a positive end on one side 
and there'll be a negative end on the side where the oxygen is that's kind of holding the electrons closer to it. So that's a polar covalent bond, unequal sharing of electrons. And again, the hydrogen bond will form when the positive end of one polar molecule is weakly attracted to the negative end of another. So this is showing hydrogen bonds between water molecules. So we have kind of a positive end near a hydrogen atom is being weakly, very weakly attracted to the negative end of an oxygen atom. And this weak attraction is called a hydrogen bond. This is what gives water its unique properties. So the boiling point, freezing point of water, um, surface tension of water, because the molecules of water are weakly attracted to each other, it gives water very unique properties. Okay, so that's a little bit about bonding between atoms. So what are some words that we use to describe when two atoms come together? A, a molecule is when two or more atoms chemically combine. So for example, water. So anytime atoms come together and combine, they form a molecule. Um, a compound is a chemical combination of two or more different types of atoms. So for example, sodium chloride is a compound. But a molecule would just be when any, any two atoms come together, that's a molecule. But a compound, would, you would specifically have to have two different types of atoms coming together. A chemical reaction occurs when um, these atoms come together, form bonds, or they break to form something else. So a chemical reaction is any time that a chemical bond is formed or broken between an atom, an ion, ion, a molecule, and a compound. And when we talk about chemical reactions, we're talking and referring to those that are occurring in the body at all times, where we'll have some sort of reactants, like let's say oxygen and water combining in the body, and they'll combine to form some sort of product, which is a substance that results from the reaction. And we, we have to talk about chemistry in terms of chemical reactions, because this is kind of the language of chemistry. Chemical reactions describe you know, starting with, let's say, ingredients. So another way to describe this might be if you guys like to bake or cook in your kitchen. The reactants are the ingredients, let's say the salt, the sugar, the eggs, flour, chocolate chips, and then the product is the end product, let's say a chocolate chip cookie. So a chemical reaction, this occurs in the body all the time. Um, you have reactants that go in to the reaction and then you'll have different products that come out. Um, and there's usually bonds that are breaking between molecules in order to form a new product. We can have synthesis reactions, which build new molecules. And whenever we build a new molecule in the body, when we build fat, when we make something else in your body, um, this always requires energy. So for an example of this is taking adenosine diphosphate, adding another phosphate group to it, and changing it into adenosine triphosphate. And its decomposition reaction is just breaking down a molecule. And this releases energy because we're just kind of breaking something apart. So an example of a decomposition reaction is taking ATP and breaking it down into adenosine diphosphate, and it's one phosphate. You said group. to convert? Can you hear me? Quick. Okay. Energy and chemical reaction. So this just describes um, taking a reactant and forming it into a product. So for taking, let's say, um, adenosine triphosphate, which has three phosphate groups to it, and if we kind of break it up into a molecule with two phosphates and an extra phosphate group, that releases energy because we're just taking something big and just breaking it down. But if we're moving from a reactant, let's say we take adenosine diphosphate, which has two phosphate groups, and we add another phosphate group to it, that does require energy to form our larger synthesis product. So this just looks at how energy is either required or being released during a chemical reaction, um, depending if it's creating something or breaking it down. An exchange reaction is another type of reaction. This occurs a lot of times in the body too. Um, this is combining synthesis and decomposition at the same time because we're breaking things down as well as creating new products at the end. So for example, if we have hydrochloric acid and we combine it with um, sodium hydroxide, basically we're breaking the bonds in between these hydrogen and chlorine atoms and sodium and oxygen and hydrogen atoms. And we're just kind of switching things up 
to get new products, to get sodium chloride and water at the end. So that's an example of an exchange reaction where atoms are kind of just kind of interchanged or flip-flopped uh, between products. How are you guys feeling so far? Is everyone still with me or are we lost already? It's okay. It's okay if we're lost and you can always write in the chat if you guys have a question, I try to keep an eye on that. I promise after this chemistry chapter, things will get a little more interesting. Energy and chemical reactions. If we talk about a reversible reaction, that means it can go in both directions. So that means that your um, reactants, what you start with, will create products, but it can also go in reverse, meaning the products can go back and make reactants. And this usually occurs in what we call an equilibrium, where the rate of product formation equals the rate of reactant formation. So things are being created um, at the same time in what we call a reversible reaction. Okay, then what is energy? Um, energy is important because I talked about how we needed energy to do some of these chemical reactions. So energy is the capacity needed to do work. And work is moving matter. So moving your coffee cup, moving a table, um, moving a pile of dirt, that is what work is. Kinetic energy is energy in motion and potential energy is stored energy. And the best way I can describe kinetic versus potential energy is I have a, well, like I have water and coffee on my desk right now and they have a lot of potential energy that's stored. If my two-year-old comes in here and pulls them off my desk, that is changing their potential energy into kinetic energy because my coffee is spilling to the floor, probably breaking, and my water is falling to the floor. So energy in motion is kinetic and potential energy is stored energy. And a lot of things that give um, you know, anything potential energy is usually things that um, are up higher than the surface of the earth. So they, due to gravity, they have potential energy, as well as uh, potential energy is always stored in chemical bonds. So bonds that connect two atoms together, if those two atoms are bonded to each other, remember when we break those apart, they'll give off energy. So energy is stored as potential energy within a bond. Uh, and specifically, the chemical energy is what we call pot that potential energy that's stored in chemical bonds. And food molecules like glucose contain potential energy so that when you eat an apple and your body digests it into glucose molecules, glucose will then go in um, to a reaction to form energy because glucose can be broken apart. And when we break glucose apart or break apart its bonds, we release energy. Another example that releases energy is breaking down adenosine triphosphate, which has three phosphate groups. So it's kind of like kind of just three phosphate groups connected together. But when we break apart the bonds and we break it into a molecule with adenosine diphosphate with two phosphate groups and kind of one off to the side, because we've broken down that bond, we've released energy. So that's chemical energy is potential energy stored in chemical bonds. The rate at which we can do all these chemical reactions, and this is really important to remember because again, in your body, chemical reactions are occurring all the time, turning the food that you eat into energy, um, making carbon dioxide able to be kind of dissolved as a molecule that your blood can transport out of the body. So the rate at which a chemical reaction proceeds is influenced by the concentration of the reactants. So kind of how much you start with something the temperature, usually higher temperatures, hotter temperatures cause reactions to go faster. Too hot will kind of kill off the reaction. Too hot will kind of kill off the reaction. But usually warmer temperatures up to a, a point cause the reaction to go faster. And then a catalyst, it's an organic molecule that helps speed up the rate of the reaction too. So concentration within limits, the higher concentration of what you begin with, the reactants, uh, the faster the reaction will occur. Temperature also within limits, the higher the temperature, the faster the rate. And catalyst, we'll talk about what a catalyst is, but they increase the rate of the reaction without they themselves being changed or used up. So those are kind of three things that can increase the rate of chemical reactions. 
We'll talk a little more here about acids and bases, and we'll talk about pH and what that means and why this is important in your body. First of all, it's always important in your body to maintain a constant pH, and your body's blood is usually about 7.4. And if your blood pH gets too high or too low, that number, bad things can happen. You can go into acidosis or um, alkalosis, which are huge problems. But anyway, let's talk about acids and bases. And then later on in the course, we'll get to what those problems can cause. So an acid is a proton or a hydrogen donor. So that's what an acid is. And acids always have a pH below of seven. And a very strong acid with a pH of about one is hydrochloric acid. You do not want to get this on your skin. It'll, it'll burn a hole through your skin. A base is a proton acceptor. So it's anything that can accept extra hydrogen atoms. And it will have a pH above seven. And a very strong base is sodium hydroxide. And here we have a pH scale. And it's always measured in kind of the concentration in moles per liter, which we don't really talk about, but it's a concentration of hydroxide ions or hydrogen ions. And that kind of concentration of those ions will then give us our pHs. So here we have neutral right down the middle, um, has a pH of seven and distilled water is pH of seven with nothing else in it. Blood is about 7.4, so just slightly basic, but not much. Then we have seawater, baking soda, the Great Salt Lake, an order of stronger and stronger bases, household ammonia, soda ash, oven cleaner, and then sodium hydroxide is a very strong base. Whenever you get to extremes, either on strong acids or strong bases, you want to be careful with those substances. Urine and saliva is slightly acidic, black coffee, tomatoes, um, you know, fruit, citrus food, oranges, lemons, limes, vinegar, cola, and beer are more acidic. Lemon juice, stomach acid is very acidic. And that's important because your stomach helps to break down things you eat. So the, the strong acidity of the stomach helps you break down things that you eat. That's also why if you have acid reflux and you taste that, it's, it's an acidic taste you're tasting because it's reflux from your stomach, which is usually very acidic. And then hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Inorganic versus organic chemistry. And if you love chemistry, you can go on and take classes only about inorganic and only about organic. Um, when we talk about inorganic chemistry, and we kind of we need to understand the, these two words because there will be inorganic compounds in your body and substances and organic substances in your body. And if something is inorganic, it usually deals with substances that do not contain carbon. And in, in organic chemistry, it's the study of things that do contain carbon. And carbon is one of the main kind of um, atoms that make up your body along with oxygen and hydrogen. So if I talk about anything inorganic, it will not have carbon to it. An organic compound will have the carbon atom in it. Like everything, there's an exception. So some carbon containing compounds are not or organic in that they do not also contain hydrogen. So carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a waste product of all of our body cells. This is what we breathe out when we exhale breath. Um, this is an inorganic compound technically too. So organic molecules, um, the carbon's unique ability as an atom can form covalent bonds with other atoms, and this make, makes carbon very possible to form very large and diverse and complicated models, molecules for life. And the four main groups of organic molecules that living organisms need and that are essential to life are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and we'll go over those four main groups now. Um, you know, your test questions for lecture will always be multiple choice, but they might as well where you'll have um, like the body systems and you'll have to list what are the structures and function of each body system. So all of your test questions will always be multiple choice, but there might be some like matching questions that re relate to content as well. And this might be good matching question, these four groups and then knowing kind of the key signature item of the four groups. So carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, where the hydrogen to oxygen is in a two to one ratio. 
And the biggest, most important, easiest example of a carbohydrate is glucose, which is a simple sugar, um, also called a monosaccharide. So C6H12O6, that is glucose. It's a monosaccharide because it's one sugar. Um, you can have glucose, you can have fructose, but monosaccharides are the building blocks of carbohydrates. So you'll have many glucose or fructose molecules kind of bounded together to make longer carbohydrate molecules. A disaccharide will be two sugars um, bounded together. So for example, sucrose is just binding glucose and fructose together. Lactose is binding glucose and galactose, which is another name of a monosaccharide together. And then polysaccharide is just binding many, many of these simple and disaccharide sugars together to make long chains of sugars. So we'll get starch, grain, vegetables, glycogen. These are all examples of carbohydrates, but they are called polysaccharides, poly because many sugars that are just bounded together. So this is an example of what glucose looks like and how we bond it to fructose. The, um, the blue shading shows how they're just sharing electrons. We take out a water, so we take out some atoms and we get this kind of bond that forms between two simple sugars and we call this sucrose. Why do essential organisms or why do organisms need carbohydrates as an essential molecule for life? Well, carbohydrates are short-term energy storage. They can be converted to glucose very quickly. And glucose is what is very important and required to make ATP. And ATP in our bodies is like money. ATP is what your bodies need to function. So I call it the currency of the body. ATP is the energy that all of your cellular processes need to function. Brain cells especially require lots of glucose to make lots of ATP. So again, why do we need carbohydrates? Well, they can be easily converted or broken down into glucose, and then glucose will go on to make ATP or energy, which our bodies need. Some characteristics of lipids, so this is kind of our second group then of the essential compound that organisms need for life. Lipids contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. They have a lower proportion of oxygen to carbon than do carbohydrates, and they are insoluble in water. That means that they cannot dissolve in water. And if you don't believe me, take some vegetable oil after class, try to mix it up with water and see if it can dissolve. But examples of lipids are fats, oils, cholesterol, triglycerides, and phospholipids. And we need all of these uh, for life. Your lipids are important because they store energy more long-term. They insulate against heat loss. So underneath the surface of our skin, we all have a layer of fat that helps to keep our bodies warm. Lipids provide a protective cushion for organs. Um, and then cholesterol type of lipid is part of your cell membrane structure. And we're gonna talk a lot about cell membranes in the next chapter. And cell membranes are the part of the cell that forms a boundary around the cells. And cholesterol is very important for that. Here we have types of lipids. We have saturated and unsaturated types of lipids. Uh, a saturated lipid just means there's a single covalent bond between carbon atoms. So they're just kind of as one kind of sharing of electron pairs. So saturated lipids are beef, pork, whole milk, cheese, and eggs. And then unsaturated mean, means there's one or more double bonds, it means there's more like double bonds in between the carbons. So just looking at the two, are saturated fats healthier than unsaturated fats? And you might have heard, well, olive oil is more healthy, and it's because it's an unsaturated. I mean, um, basically, saturated fat means these lipids look like a zigzag, and um, that's a terrible zigzag. But what happens is these saturated fats can um, kind of just bind on top of each other because they're saturated. And then because they're nice and single bonded, they all look the same. Um, and they can just stack nice and parallel on top of each other. So it's really hard for your body to break down saturated fat. Unsaturated fat has these double bonds, which whenever you have a double bond, it kind of messes up 
your movement of this kind of connection. So if we have kind of one saturated fat, one unsaturated fat that looks like this with double bonds, and we have another one with the double bond going in the opposite direction, it's a lot harder for these fats to stack on top of on top of each other because the double bonds kind of make don't make them able to be nicely stacked. So unsaturated fats, because they're not nicely tightly packed together, they're just easy, easier for your body to break apart. So that's why unsaturated fats are considered healthier. They're just easier for your body to digest. Triglycerides um, basically contain a glycerol, mo mo glycerol molecule, and they put a triglyceride molecule, you kind of put three um, glycerol molecules with the backbone. So this is a triglyceride molecule. Again, it's just a type of fat. Here are fatty acids, saturated versus unsaturated. So this is kind of the picture I was trying to draw. If you notice all the single bonds between carbons, the Cs, they're nice and flat or straight. Again, so you can stack them on top of each other, which makes it harder for your body to break apart. Whereas unsaturated fats have these crinks with double bonds meaning it's just harder for you to stack up unsaturated fats. So it's just easy, easier for your body to break apart. Phospholipids have a polar head, kind of shown in blue here, and a non-polar tail. And phospholipids are important for making up cell membranes. And we'll talk about how phospholipids make up cell membranes um, in the next chapter. Characteristics of protein. So this is our third group of essential molecules necessary for life. Uh, proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Um, amino acids are building blocks of protein, and we have 20 different naturally occurring amino acids, and they combine together in chains of amino acids to form different proteins. Amino acids themselves contain what we call an amine group and a carboxyl group. And amino acids are never stored. So this is what you need a daily supply for um, in your diet. So here we have two amino acids. One is in green and one is in red. And what we're showing here is we're joining the amino acids together with a bond. And as we join amino acids together, we'll form different protein structures. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. As we join amino acids together, we will create different proteins. Here we have a linear sequence of amino acids. So a protein um, will consist of a chain of different amino acids and each amino acid is colored with a different color here. So this is a protein which is showing kind of a linear chain of amino acids. Proteins will then go on and fold over and on top of themselves. So a three-dimensional or a 3D representation of a protein will then show how those amino acids kind of fold on top of each other. And an entire protein has a very complex three-dimensional shape where some parts are kind of folded on top of each other. Others are kind of tightly coiled or wound helixes. So this is just how we go from a protein, a linear kind of structure or sequence of amino acids. They will eventually fold on top of each other to form kind of a folded protein or a helixes or coiled protein. Why do we need protein? So proteins are the most diverse um, kind of molecule in the body because they're used for everything. They're used to make your skin, your hair, your nails, your muscles. They're part of the hemoglobin molecule, which helps to um, take oxygen and carry oxygen in the blood. They act as enzymes, which speed up chemical reactions. Proteins have a really important role in your immune system, so fighting off disease. Um, they are make up your muscle contractions, actin and myosin are type of proteins. We'll talk about when we get to your muscle system. And proteins are also a part of your cell membrane. So proteins have a lot of different functions. They're a very diverse group. Proteins can be denatured. And denatured means that they don't work anymore. Protein denaturation occurs when hydrogen bonds that maintain the protein shape, whether they're folded or coiled, um, are broken. And then the protein will become non-functional. So if your protein loses its shape, it's not able to work anymore. 
And factors that can basically cause denaturation are high temperatures, so temperature that's too hot, or improper pH levels. So this goes back to keeping your body at a proper pH. If things are messed up with pH levels in your blood, a lot of bad things happen, including your proteins will not be able to work properly. Enzymes were one of those types of proteins. We also call them an organic catalyst, so they'll contain carbon. They will increase the rate at which a biochemical reaction in your body can proceed without it being damaged or used up or changed. And enzymes really simply work by lowering the energy of activation. And the easiest way I can describe this is if we start a chemical reaction with your reactants, so again, these are the ingredients you start with, and we're trying to get our product at the end, let's say a chocolate chip cookie. What enzymes will do is they lower this kind of activation energy. So EA stands for activation energy. You can see that the activation energy, this hump that the reactants need to get over to form products is much higher without an enzyme. But the activation energy required to go from reactants to products in the presence of an enzyme, you can see how the hump is much lower. So it's just easier to push those reactants over the hill with the enzyme because there's less of a hill or less of an energy activation barrier to get over. So that's what enzymes do. They just lower this kind of energy activation barrier. So it's easier so that reactants can form products more quickly. This is kind of a look at what an enzyme does. So if we have two molecules, A and B, they'll both bind an enzyme. An enzyme will kind of just help with them together. And then it will, as a new molecule, the enzyme will go unchanged and be able to use it again in a different reaction. But what the enzyme has helped us form is a new molecule, um, but using less energy, and it'll happen a lot faster. So that's the action of enzymes. Uh, nucleic acid, I think this is our fourth group of essential molecules necessary for life. And I think we're almost done with the slide here or the PowerPoint. Um, nucleic acids are composed of carbon, hydrogen atoms, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus atoms. And a big example of nucleic acids are DNA and RNA, which are deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. And DNA and RNA hold kind of the blueprints or instructions for creating proteins and genetic material in your body. Nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids, and they're composed of a nitrogen base, a phosphate group, and then a five carbon sugar. So here we have a nucleotide, which makes up DNA, for example. It has a phosphate group, a sugar, and then a nitrogenous base. And so, for example, these nitrogenous bases in DNA are um, thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. And these nitrogenous bases are bound to each other via hydrogen bonds, which are very, very weak. And when they're bound to each other, they cause the structure of DNA to kind of look like a helix type pattern or coiled. DNA needs to constantly be kind of broken apart and put back together. So these hydrogen bonds, because they're weak, it allows DNA to be broken apart, to be replicated, you know, passed on down to future generations and then come back together. So this is a structure of DNA. And again, DNA um, is a type of nucleic acid. Adenosine triphosphate then um, is kind of our last essentially important organic molecule found in all living organisms, abbreviated ATP. I'll be talking a lot about ATP this whole course, this whole semester. It consists of an adenosine um, base and three phosphate groups. And ATP, again, I call it the money or the energy currency of your cells because it's capable of both storing and providing energy. And it does that in its chemical bonds. So here's the structure of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And it So adenosine triphosphate contains all phosphate group. It becomes adenosine diphosphate. So that would be adenosine diphosphate with just two phosphate groups um, and then adenosine. And if we would just have one phosphate group, that would just be a phosphate group by itself. 
So that's ATP. We have energy stored in these chemical bonds that are kind of shown in these wavy lines so that when we break a chemical bond, we can release energy. And that is ATP. So that's chemistry uh, and kind of our brief 45 minute introduction on chemistry. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and you kind of followed with me a little bit. I'll go ahead and stop the recording, but then I'll stay on and answer any questions for those of you guys who are still here.